30 seconds. Okay, we're coming up on 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our Onc Live webinar on COVID-19 management for the CRC physician. I'm your moderator this evening, Daria Zangari, Scientific Director for Onc Live, and I'm very happy to be with all of you tonight. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free forum discussion on how you and your colleagues are managing your patients with colorectal cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will cover a list of topics that our faculty will go into greater detail on sharing insights from the front line. As you can see from this slide, we will be discussing a variety of topics centered around who is at risk, how we are managing these patients, the incorporation of telehealth visits, how treatment decisions may be impacted, emerging guidelines, and addressing patient concerns. A couple quick housekeeping notes. If you are listening to this webinar, we encourage you to submit any questions you have, and we will try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Also, to expand your video player to full screen, click on the icon on the lower right of the player, hit escape on your keyboard to revert back to the smaller player. We have two distinguished experts joining us for tonight's presentation, and I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves and give their titles and affiliations. So uh -huh. uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Marshall. Yeah, I guess I'll go first then. So hello, everybody. Good evening or late afternoon, wherever you are. My name is John Marshall. Um, I am a professor at Georgetown University and the director of the Roosh Center for the Cure of GI Cancers. Um, coming to you live from my basement in Arlington, as I'm sure many of you guys have spent time in, in your homes as well. Um, we have a bunch to cover over the hour, and we really hope to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So we do encourage you to ask questions, and I think Tony and I would be more than happy, even if those are specific cases, we might be able to field and, and give you some advice on what we might do in a specific uh, setting for a patient, but we do want to kind of try, try to cover everything from adjuvant to metastatic to palliative um, and how, you know, our advice on how to manage colon cancer over the next uh, few months. So uh, I'll shut up and I'll let my good friend and good partner on the other side of the country where it's still sunshiny um, introduce himself. Tony, take it away. Sunny every day in, uh, in Arizona, no doubt. So in this uh, very interesting time, uh, so glad to be able uh, to join multiple colleagues, of course, you know, on, online, uh, uh, you know, going through uh, the, the difficult time we're all going through and trying to understand how to navigate the very new world. So I'm Tony Bikai Saab. I'm uh, a professor uh, at Mayo Clinic uh, on the beautiful campus uh, of Arizona. Uh, I uh, also lead the GI cancer program across the uh, Mayo Clinic enterprise. Uh, and uh, so glad to be here. So thanks, Tony. Um, let's go on to our next slide. Um, and take it away, Daria, and you're going to go through some of the numbers. All right. So to start us off, I would just like to provide some very quick numbers on the current state of COVID-19. So currently to date, the number of global confirmed COVID-19 cases are over 1.5 million. The United States officially has the most confirmed cases at 454,304, uh, 454, with 16,267 deaths. So with that, nationwide social distancing guidelines are in place until April 30th, and then will be reevaluated. Uh, the regulations and the rate at which these guidelines have been enforced are varying by state, with new epicenters um, emerging daily. So while these guidelines are extremely important to lessen the spread, they're much more difficult to adhere to for patients with serious medical conditions that require urgent attention. Tonight, we are gonna focus on how COVID-19 has impacted our patients, specifically those with colorectal cancer. So with that, I would like it to turn uh, towards one of the first topics of discussion, 
Um, are the patients with colorectal cancer at a greater risk for COVID-19? We'll have Dr. Marshall go through some of this data and uh, Dr. Marshall and Dr. Saab will give their insights on this topic. So thanks very much, Daria. I, I just wanna start off with, I saw an amazing graphic today uh, of watching deaths from COVID-19 disease go from a little blip on a curve to now the number one cause of daily death here in the United States, surpassing cardiovascular disease and cancer. And we're kind of watching in, in our centers um, and keeping count uh, of the number of people that are, are dying every day from this disease and just crossing our fingers tight as it can be is, you know, how, how flat is our curve going to be? And, you know, the story begins and reviewed in this slide that you see in front of you uh, in Wuhan, China. Now, we were just talking before we, we logged on, uh, just reminding ourselves about this pangola, which is an animal, uh, like a dragon-like armadillo-looking thing that lives uh, in Asia. Um, uh, part of its DNA or part of a virus that lives in a pangola got uh, mixed with a bat uh, uh, virus. Um, and that is essentially what uh, coronavirus that is, is infecting the world is. And it's a very interesting virus. Um, it has some characteristics that we're seeing played out in the clinic. And so as an aside, I would encourage all of you who are interested, there are some pretty good lectures online, one from UCSF that was fabulous that we had our whole team watch that basically how this thing ticks. And so it gives us a better sense of what to expect on an individual patient. When are they shedding virus? When are they likely to get infected? This sort of thing. So just as we spent the first couple of years of medical school uh, learning the basics of how we're put together and how these uh, infectious agents work, for example, we kind of need to go back to school to learn that so that we can best apply uh, that knowledge as we are all being asked uh, to do more and more for these patients. But our topic tonight, of course, is, is the issue of, of cancer itself. Um, but the Wuhan stuff is a limited data set. It gets reported a lot. It is only, uh, you know, these 18 patients out of that first cohort. I checked today from some friends who know people. This hasn't been updated either here or in Italy. Um, but it did suggest, because a lot of these patients were lung cancer patients that they had a, a worse uh, outcome, that there, there are percentages of having the serious infection uh, were higher. If we can have the, the next slide. Uh, we also looked at things like uh, age and, and other comorbidities. And so that's been part of this wave is that older people, people with comorbidities and our cancer patients also tend to be older and of course have comorbidities and maybe also an immune system issues make them at somewhat uh, increased risk uh, for the being both symptomatic and having serious consequences. What's less clear to me, Tony, I'll kind of get your opinion right away. Do you think that people are more likely, cancer patients are more likely to get infected or and or more likely just to get sick from the infection? Yeah, John, this is, this is the million uh, plus dollar question. I think the data is too premature. You know, we're seeing this barrage of data coming our way. In fact, I don't know who's reviewing those bit and that they get published so quickly in high impact journals. So, you know, in the in the in dire times like ours, you know, stringency is not the rule. We want to learn as much as we can very quickly. You're absolutely right. I think we have to be careful. Uh, we have to be careful to stigmatize to say just because you have cancer, you're at higher risk to capture the virus. The reality is we know from influenza, we know from other viruses, and this is not the same, right. uh, very different, but I mean, all, all viruses behave the same in terms of their transmissibility in some ways. Um, having cancer does not necessarily mean you're more likely to get it. Now, why is it more likely to get sicker uh, if you have cancer and you're on treatment? One, as you said, John, these patients are older. Patients with cancer tend to be older. So we, we do see those patients, they may have more comorbidities, whether related uh, to, to uh, other, other issues, or if lung cancer, they had, you know, they're smokers, they may have emphysema, they may have heart disease. Uh, so we have to be careful about how to interpret this data. And I don't want to make it sound that we should put all our case cancer patients, hide them, lock them in a room and not consider treatment, which I guess we'll get to that yes. uh, later. Uh, but one thing is clear, is 
with our cancer patients, we have to be extra careful with measures that protect them from getting the virus yeah. because they, uh, again, tend to, for, for, for many reasons that we tend to understand with other viruses as well, they tend to actually take this worse and they're at higher risk for mortality. Yeah, we'll get back to that with, I'm sure, examples from both of us. We can have the next slide for everybody. So, you know, in Italy, which is another major hotspot, and of course, we also are now getting some data out of Spain, um, you know, we're seeing a very high mortality rate, 7% of those they tested um, uh, dying of their disease and overwhelming their ICUs. Um, and so this, that shock, if you will, of those events as what's really forced all of us as hospitals and hospital systems to try and do what we can uh, to prepare. There's a nice table in that slide about older individuals and mortality. Uh, it certainly does increase. Um, this that One of those lectures I listened to suggested that older people might have a blunted or a slower immune response. And so um, it may be that they produce more virus more rapidly um, and get, therefore, the bad lung infection. But these are all just speculations at this point because we all can tell stories of 35-year-olds who are perfectly healthy with no comorbidities who are getting this disease uh, and getting quite sick as well. So next slide from that. Um, so they did look at a subset from the Italian patients. Again, older. These are almost 80 years old, mean age, um, other pre-existing conditions, and uh, 20 percent of the patients had an active cancer. Now that's not defined. This is, we actually followed up with this investigator earlier today and no new data is out from this, although they are tracking this very closely um, to try and learn as, as we go. I'm sure Mayo Clinic is doing this. Uh, we're doing this. We're tracking all of our patients um, that have been tested positive, whether inpatient or outpatient, and just seeing what happens because we need to add to this data pool. Um, Tony, I was, I'm betting Mayo's doing exactly the same thing to try and figure this out. Yes, and, uh, and uh, in addition, you know, to screening symptomatic patients, we're probably going to start screening every inpatient, every patient that undergoes a procedure. We're also, you know, trying to establish serologic testing, although, you know, as, as you and I talked before this, that there are limitations with uh, understanding the value of the serologic testing. Uh, so we certainly are trying to do as much as possible uh, to have everyone through the door tested one way or the other. Proactively, right now, we test mostly patients, you know, with temperatures and symptom checks, and those that are symptomatic are being checked. Yeah. Uh, that, that will continue expanding uh, as, we, as we, because we want to learn more and more about this. We want to learn, I mean, there was a report that suggested that almost uh, uh, another uh, 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 three to four percent of patients. So about half of the patients who get infected with this virus have no symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but yet they seem to shed uh, uh, the virus. So asymptomatic patients can shed the virus, yeah. uh, which certainly adds to the numbers, but also adds to the risk and ultimately will add to the denominator uh, once this is hopefully behind us. Yeah, I was interested. Let me just follow up right now with this topic is, is you know, testing everybody. We're having our discussion at our uh, Georgetown about we want to keep our cancer unit COVID free, right? And yet, you know, a lot of patients don't, you don't know, they're not symptomatic when they get admitted for whatever, and then they find it later. Um, so there is some debate about testing, and it's not easy, right? You got to put that thing way back in, in yeah. those to do it. So that even, you know, testing everybody, maybe even staff that go into that unit, um, you know, should be tested. The surgeons are saying the same thing is that maybe they could test everybody. Maybe that decreases the amount of PPE we're using, this sort of thing. But then the other counter is, uh, you know, is that a false sense of, you know, uh, safety? And that may make us be less careful you know, when we're going in to see patients. It's one of my inpatient attendings right now told me that they're almost more afraid of the, you know, the people who are asymptomatic and not being tested than they are the ones that are retreating as if they might be positive. What, what do you guys think about that? No, absolutely. I mean, this is the biggest concern is, you know, if you test a positive for exposure, IgG, let's say, and let's even say that you're protected, which we're not sure yet that that means you're protected, uh, you know, that, that, that makes you feel like a, a superhero. You go into a patient's room, you know, you become a little bit less careful. And what, you, what you're going to do 
you 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 will likely be uh, be. I mean, and as human natural human instinct, uh, you may you may end up transmitting the virus, uh, 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 you know, perhaps unintentionally even back to your family. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, there is mixed. There's there's a mixed bag that comes with this. Uh, because again, frankly, you know, although there are all these studies that are being published, I don't think you know epidemiologically we still understand the impact of this virus. Yeah. You know, it is said somewhere that it's only affecting three percent of the population. Uh, you know, others would say five percent. That means you know ninety-five percent would remain at risk. And so you know, this wave that's coming will keep on coming back and coming back and coming back until we understand a little bit more, and then maybe above our pay grade here, but a little bit more about how to control, uh, you know, the spread of this virus more efficiently. But I think the measures that are being undertaken right now by, by Georgetown, Mayo and others are to protect as many patients as possible. And the most vulnerable, uh, as you said, you know, are those cancer patients. How do we keep them as much as possible protected, especially those under treatment, protected from uh, from uh, exposure to the virus. And I think that's where we want to go. That's why people have logged on. So I think next slide. Um, let's go ahead and skip this. This is a basic timing of, of dyspnea and admission and ARDS. So you get a sense of the timeline there. But I think most of us are pretty familiar with that. So let's could go on to the next one. Um, and then this is, again, the, the, the lung cancer patient. So I'm not going to do this again. Let's go on to colon cancer then. All right. So. Tony and I were just talking about whether our patients are GI cancer, specifically colorectal cancer patients, are at increased risk or not. And I think we both kind of came to the same place. We're not sure about whether they're at increased risk of getting an infection, but we certainly are nervous that if they were to get one, um, that uh, they might be at higher probability uh, of having a serious complication from it. Um, and... Um, you know, I, I've even seen some data, and Tony, what's your opinion on this, is even patients who'd had cancer. So I'm getting a lot of emails from my, you know, follow-up stage twos and stage threes um, about, you know, their risk based on what they've heard. What's your, what's your recommendation to that email? You know, I, I, I think that uh, the concern that they may be at a higher risk just because they had history of cancer is questionable unless, again, they're older. So older than 65 is a risk factor because it also correlates with a higher risk uh, of comorbidities. So just having a history of cancer, I don't think by itself uh, is, uh, is or predisposes you for a higher risk of mortality unless you fit the other boxes. But common sense says if you have a patient with stage 2 colon cancer who, uh, you know, is six months or a year out, you know, most of the times, all these patients come to our clinic, they get a blood check, uh, they get a CT scan, uh, you know, 80, 70, 80% chance, everything is gonna look good. Why, why expose them to unnecessary risk? Uh, and at the same time, why expose patients who may be at higher risk, those on chemotherapy or therapy, to someone who's, uh, who, who's coming in for a visit that may not be needed? These are the patients, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, although I don't believe they're necessarily at higher risk other than the normal risk of their age and comorbidities. But those are the patients, you know, that I gladly have them now just do their scan, do their labs, and I'm video conferencing with them. Uh, uh, and if, if you don't have video conferencing, you could face them depending on what your hospital does or even a phone visit. Those are the patients where, you know, you would consider that the, the, the risks of bringing them are not really worth it for them or added risk to the patients who are actually undergoing treatment. Yeah, and I think that's what we're here to kind of discuss is where is that line? And the way I, the way I sort of start my thinking about this is that cancer care in and of itself is not elective. Mm -hmm. right? So you can't just say, I'll see you in a few months. Uh, I'll do your knee replacement. I'll do whatever in a few months, but now's not the time. You've got to keep some steady drumbeat of yep. care and what you were talking about right there is is maybe the easiest group to deal with and that is that long-term follow-up patient right no no reason to come to the hospital now you know if it's a cea you need you know maybe go to your local lab core with a mask on if it's a ct scan you need if you're asymptomatic would you delay or would you say go ahead and get it somewhere 
if you're you're up for your annual CT or your six month CT or however often you do it. Yeah. So so here here again, you know, um, from from strategy always comes opportunities to re-examine our processes. I think we do we overscan our patients, yeah. uh, and and so we need to take a step back and and really think: Do I really need to get a scan? You know, many of the stage two colon cancer patients don't need a scan. It may be one in a year, and that's it. Uh, but we we, t we I tend to see those patients being scanned three to six months. Yeah. I think this is the time to re-examine whether that's really. I mean, the guidelines are clear. You don't need to. Um, but a symptomatic patient, you bring in. You, that's yeah. the, absolutely, that you can do a call. You can do a video on those patients. Absolutely, those are the patients that I call routine surveillance. Now, stage three C patient, high risk. You don't want to miss uh, your liver lesion. Yeah. You know, I, I still want to see that scan done when I think it needs to be done three to six months or every six months is okay. Now, delaying a month is acceptable. You know, now that our resources are being stretched out, the immediate thought is that maybe we don't want to overwhelm our, uh, you know, radiology units, et cetera, and keep with the principle of social distancing and distancing patients. So, you know, some patients may be delayed a month. Sure. Like you said, they're asymptomatic or their labs look good. You can use CAA and labs as your guide, especially if CA was elevated before surgery. How about CT DNA? I mean, you know, we're hearing a lot of that company. One of the companies has a, a service where they'll go to your house um, and draw your your circulating tumor DNA. Is that you, you thought about doing that? Anybody yet? You know, I'm still a little concerned about the value of what that adds to my decision making tree. I know some folks, you know. Uh, ad advocate for, for it to help with the decision tree. I, I think we need to learn a little bit more about it. My concern is that, you know, if it's positive, that doesn't perhaps mean that there is more likely that the cancer is coming back, but am I going to put the patient now at unnecessary risk to get a scan uh, versus, you know, the scheduled time? The, the answer is a little bit difficult here. I think you could consider it as part of your global as long as it's not the only decision, uh, it could be considered. And they go to their home and they're, you know, COVID, uh, how do we call this? COVID, uh, you know, clean or COVID uh, 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 kosher or whatever you want to call it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. But, but those, those definitely may be the patients we want to be extra uh, careful with for now. Okay, let's spend about 20 minutes kind of drilling down on specific scenarios because we, I think we both have some uh, opinions about this. So we've agreed we want to decrease hospital exposure, but at the same time, we want to maintain the outcomes. We, you know, those patients who have um, a curative option in particular or effective palliative options, um, we need to somehow keep managing those patients. Our staffs are having to look both ways, right? I bet yours are too, where we're being trained on how to be hospitalists or ER doctors at the same time we have to keep track of that. So uh, let's look um, at some of the basic principles. So, um, you know, what I think of high on my list would be, um, you know, reducing myelosuppression. And when I think about our regimens that cause myelosuppression, you know, really full Firinox is maybe the big one, the Lawn Surf Task 102 can do it. Um, and so I would tend to drop the bolus. I might even start lower with my ox and eerie um, on, a, on a cycle just to make sure the patient does okay, no surprises. Because really what I'm out to do is not only reduce myelosuppression, I don't want any grade three, four toxicities that are gonna land the patient in an emergency room and then maybe an admission for a day or two of supportive care. So. What's your and, and then maybe even growth factors. So, what what's your position on how to handle and reduce myelosuppression? I totally agree, and I would drop the look of warning. You know how much I. Oh yeah, I actually I put that in my paper just for you. So <laughs> I know that was just for you. When you read that, you you're gonna say, oh, I, will, I love it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know there are those that argue that it should stay, but if if it stays, it could increase the myelosuppression if it actually does what it's supposed to do. So exactly. probably would drop the look of warning. It does. Um, and, and absent the bolus 5-FU really doesn't add much value to the infusion of 5-FU. Right. Uh, so someone said that well, will COVID actually be the final nail in the, in the bolus 5-FU coffin? And, and maybe, yes. maybe it will. You know? Yes, I think 
I think again, that's that's going to be something on the long run. Folks are going to see that the results with the patients with less. So 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 let me let me go back to a principle that you know uh, more can be less, uh, meaning more cytotoxicity can be less for the patient, and we have to really rethink about how to protect our patients, not just from this virus, uh, because this virus will come and go. Hopefully, it will be gone at some point. Uh, but there'll be others, and there'll be other issues. Uh, you know, at, at this at this time, I think it's it's important to do what you said. You know, think about de-intensifying treatments. Uh, you know, drop leucovorin, drop bolus 5-FU, perhaps consider dropping the dose. We, we drop the antique and anyways, perhaps drop a little bit the oxali. You don't need all that oxali. The infusional 5-FU is safe, uh, and the bevacizumab, and growth factor support. Interestingly, there are trials that are looking at GMCSF antibodies, uh, uh, you know, against COVID. So, so I think, you know, keeping an immune system that's healthy and strong uh, is going to be key. Plus, I think you hit it right, right on the nail. Avoiding hospital admissions is going to be, you know, a, a really important effort for us because the more likely the patient is going to get to the hospital, the more likely they're going to be exposed to COVID-19 and other viruses and nosocomial bacteria, et cetera, but specifically now for COVID-19. Uh, COVID so avoiding that hospital admission is key. Uh, for the health of the patients. And so doing all these, we don't want to miss on the opportunity to give our patients the best treatment possible, yet we want to balance this out with the utmost safety. Yeah. When it comes to TAS-102, uh, you know, and that's lower down the line, you know, the, the, the neutropenia can be real, uh, is real, not can be real, is real, and febrile neutropenia in few patients. Uh, you know, uh, this is where you may consider alter alternate regimens. I mean, you've used quite a bit of the every other week, right? Yes. What, what do you see with the every other well, week? Well, you do see less myelosuppression, but this is, but you know, then you're torn between the data that says that maybe one of our only drugs for dose intensity might matter. Um, and, um, you know, the risk of myelosuppression. And um, so I would, I would, kind of go right to an every other week schedule. I think uh, if I was starting somebody at this point, um, and we are talking about more and more oral therapies as part of this bridge, yeah. um, whether that's capecitabine, regorafenib, we'll talk about in a minute, or, or TAS-102, that can bridge people for a month or two and keep them out of our hospitals. Um, and everyone would understand that. So it does become kind of an opportunity to play those cards in the metastatic palliative setting. Yeah, no, I, you know, I totally think that this brings back, I mean, uh, uh, you, you remember the paper we published in JAMA Oncology that suggested that, you know, de-intensification strategies for patients within three months of starting your four fox or four fox series, and, you know, TRIP2 was the same. It makes a lot of sense. For these patients, I think you really need to limit exposure to these intense regimens with four fox or four fox series. And within three months, really tone these patients down to keep cytabine, uh, to 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 the load and 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 bevacizumab for for maintenance strategies. That you know keeps them again uh, 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 on a delayed strategy from having to come back get treatment. They they have less uh, overall toxicity. They also need to be less uh, much in clinic. Those are the patients right. that I see only every eight to twelve weeks now, yeah. and I'm very comfortable. Uh, doing video consults with them in the meanwhile. Yeah. They only come to the infusion center, get their, you know, a bastard for 10 minutes, and then the rest, they're doing Cape Cytabine at home. And I just, you know, see them on, on, on video now. They yeah. show me their hands, they uh, show me their feet if they wish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our pharmacists, you know, uh, talk to them closely, so we keep a close eye on them. I think, I think, Post COVID nineteen, that's going to become our standard. I, I mean, so, we're, so. we're learning so much now about how we should optimize treatment. Surveillance in stage four is another thing that we have to be also be with these oligometastatic disease. So if you resect the liver and the lung and the patient is doing great, I would follow the same principles yeah. that we do for stage three disease. Yeah. If if you're NED. Right. If you're NED. In terms of follow-up, yeah. So I really like. I'm just going to reiterate the point of you know yeah. if you're in frontline therapy. Um, and you're in your first few months and things are going pretty well, drop back, go to a, a Cape Cytobine, maybe BAV even. Uh, along those lines, 
you know, some of our patients, at least around here in Washington, are so dutiful that they set their alarms by when it's time to have their port flushed. Um, if that's the only reason you're coming to clinic, don't come in to, okay, you agreeing, I'm seeing a nod. So that, our nurses are going to be mad at me, but from, from my perspective, you can be late for your for your for your metaport. So. Oh, we've seen we've seen many patients being late because they forgot a month or two and the sky did not fall. They were yeah. still doing fine. So yes. I, I put a list together of things that if you had a new patient right now, would you start a treatment? And I have it's only three things that I had on that list that I thought you really should start and not delay even a month or two. And that was if you had a new diagnosis of rectal cancer and you were going to recommend neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I think that patient should be started as soon as you can make those arrangements. Do you agree with that one? Yes. Can I add a little bit to that? Yeah. So because at least in this immediate phase where we're trying to release uh, OR ventilators, you know, uh, human capacity, for those patients, I will advocate very strongly a total new adjuvant approach, uh, where frankly uh, uh, we go with chemo, chemo radiation. So we extend the time that patients are going to be on treatment before they have to be surgery, because you know a lot of our centers are delaying such surgeries. They're making them uh, uh, less. Uh, uh, you know, they're releasing a lot of the ventilators for capacity and all this. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I agree. We start them. And we do a total neoadjuvant approach: chemotherapy the, for three uh, three months, uh, then chemotherapy radiation that gives us about six months before we have to do surgery. Right. So this that's and I'm, those are the patients that I would try to keep on schedule. I don't know that I would be uber dose intense, but I'm, I still might drop a bolus if I was going to give a full fox or. But I but I'm going to not back off too much because that to me is worth the risk of the exposure to the hospital. Um, uh, to get that done. So I'm glad you agree. Uh, the second one I had was actually high risk adjuvant stage three. Mm -hmm. so somebody had their surgery in March, the path report comes back and you've got, you know, eight positive lymph nodes, T3 disease, you know, regardless of age even. Um, uh, but, you know, I, that's a patient that I'm not, you know, I would say you have about a four to eight week window um, to initiate that treatment is good best practice. But because that's curative therapy, um, I think I would get something going there, whether I start with a little capecitabine and then add ox later or start with a dose or two of ox and risk it. What, how would you handle that in a higher risk stage three patient? 100%. I mean, you know, we know the data is strongly suggestive of if you wait one extra day beyond eight weeks, you start losing benefit. Yeah. We're talking about a cure can't afford that. So we have to do that. The second thing, I totally agree with you. We don't know how much oxaliplatin adds to fluoropyrimidine. We know it adds about a small percent, four or five percent. So the key is to have the fluoropyrimidine. So when in doubt, delay the oxaliplatin. When in doubt, skip the oxaliplatin. It's okay. Have that discussion with the patient. If the patient is 70, 75, and I've seen a lot of these patients lately, you know, 80, having fall fox. Well, the oxaliplatin is not going to add diddly squat to the 5 of you or to the Cape Cytabine in an 80-year-old, 75, and questionable above 70. So again, we have to rethink how we do our practice. For those patients, really put a question mark whether they really benefit from oxaliplatin or not. For those who may be younger and you think oxaliplatin is going to add value, as you suggested, you could start Cape Cytabine. Go for two to four weeks to see where the situation with this whole COVID thing, you know, is going to be in the next month or so. And then you can always add oxaliplatin. You've already given them the agent that's going to pull the best benefit for them. And then you can add that little sugar on top if needed. I think we're in good sync there. And then the third place that I said you would go ahead and start is a newly diagnosed first line metastatic, particularly with, you know, significant disease. And I don't mean huge bulky disease, but... I'm increasingly convinced, and this is a different message for me, folks, that, that induction combination chemotherapy translates into some survival advantage. And so I was really thinking, I mean, I, a 75-year-old with small little lung metastases, no, I'm not doing that. But uh, a traditional metastatic patient, maybe as neoadjuvant for a potential resection, I'm going to start that patient even including intravenous chemotherapy. What, what's your thought? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So this this becomes a much more complex issue. Yeah. It's, you know, who is the patient we can delay? As you said, you know, we can, and, and this, this brings back the importance of profiling this tissue. If a patient is left-sided, RAS wild type, BRF wild type, HER2 non-amplified, a microsatellite stable, has a couple of ditzel here and there, asymptomatic, you can afford to wait. Yeah. But if the patient, you know, with peritoneal disease, a little bit of ascites, right-sided tumor, man, I'm not waiting. Because in a month, I may not see this patient again. Yes. Uh, and, 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 you know, in addition to the survival advantage, we often, and, and we, have, we had to actually go to our other colleagues and administrators and say, listen, understand that chemotherapy is not just optional. It's not, it's not something that we give uh, just because we can. We give it because in addition to the survival benefit, this is a palliative in the metastatic setting. This is a palliative uh, uh, treatment. This patients feel better, feel uh, good, regain weight, regain activity, uh, and their quality of life improves. And we know that. We know that responding patients actually have all these improvements. And so delaying therapy may put us at a disadvantage, meaning you go from performance status of one to a performance status of two or three by the time we see you back to restart treatment we lose benefit and we may actually not be able to palliate our patients. And so, so treatment is actually sh should be for, for the patients who are, as you described, should be considered urgent yeah. and not considered elective or semi, even semi-urgent. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So we're in sync again. So I have four on the other end of the spectrum that I want to run by you that I, if it was going on, I would either stop it or delay uh, for these. So these are lower value things that I think we could, when I balance the risk benefit, I worry about exposure more than I do the benefit of the treatment I'm giving. And the first one is adjuvant chemotherapy after three months of treatment. I think if a patient has had three months of treatment, particularly IV, if they're getting IV treatment, um, like we talked about oxaliplatin, okay. sure, I'll continue um, Cape cytobine if you really want me to, but I might stop and say enough's enough based on the studies that we have. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, you know how I feel about this, that I think three month KPOX is the only thing the patient will need with stage three cancer or high risk stage two. Beyond that, if they're low risk, I actually stop the treatment completely. If they're high risk stage three or high risk stage two, uh, I, Again, have the discussion with the patient. Say, I'm not sure you really need more than three months of K-Pox. Mm. K-Pox, not full Fox, K-Pox. Uh, but I have the discussion about if I want to continue for another three months, drop the oxali, three months of capecitabine. So no one gets more than three months of oxaliplatin. Uh, and that's where, where it ends for all these patients, whether they're high risk, low risk. Now, with the full Fox, it's a little trickier, right? Because the data is not as clear. And it seems that we may lose benefit with, uh, with, uh, with the patients who are uh, a higher risk. But that, that one thing, one arm that was missing from all these studies was what do you do with the patients with high risk if you give them four fucks for three months, right. and continue with, four, uh, with five of you only for three months or three right. And right. I'll make a bet. I'll make a bet. And I don't like to bet except if I think I'm winning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a bet that that would be a winning strategy. Because five FU is what drives most of the benefit, or keep cytabine preferably to five FU. And okay. this again, in this world that we're living in today, and and the way we're going to live in the future, as we change our a lot of our practices, uh, we're going to turn in more and more into less is more. Okay, I, I, two, three more. One we've already covered, and that's follow up and labs. And I think we really talked about telemedicine. I'm not going to spend a lot of our time here. We're using that. All of us are using that um, with patients. We just got a three way link, so now we can talk to a patient, their daughter. It's never the son; it's always the daughter. And, um, we can talk at the same time um, uh, by tele visits, and that's clicking. And I agree with that. It's here to stay. Um, lab testing, CT scans, make good judgment about that when you need it. Uh, one that's, I think, a little controversial is palliative chemotherapy. A patient who is doing actually pretty well, decent performance status, um, but has metastatic disease, maybe second, third, fourth line, um, relative benefit versus relative risk, it, of course, depends on what you've got. Maybe we can go to the next slide with this as well. 
um, and and you know talk a little bit about initiating treatment versus not. So if we can get that next slide, there you go. So this is more about the the TAS and and Rego and um, uh, using orals in this space versus in a total holiday. What's your thoughts about that? Yeah, that that see this is this it becomes quite quite an important discussion here. Is what do we do with those patients? That we know. I mean, with both agents, there are some patients who can pull, uh, you know, another year of life or more, uh, and can can see a delay and deterioration of, uh, uh, you know, of quality uh, of their quality of life. I mean, we've seen with regorafenib when we did the redo study, which at this point of time, I think you have no option but to use the redo strategy, meaning the dose escalation strategy from. 80 to 120 to 160 on a weekly basis as tolerated uh, for those patients. Well, we and you can do that totally by telehealth if they can go get their labs somewhere, right? You don't have yeah. to bring them in. That's perfect no. for telehealth, right? Absolutely. And that's how we're doing it. I mean, my, my nurse or my pharmacist or both actually uh, alternate. They call the, the patients now. I mean, uh, 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 the whole pool of, of, of us are doing this individually with patients and alternating. You call them, you check on them. Actually, with video conferencing, you know, again, they show you their hands, you wish their feet as well. Uh, you ask them a few questions, and then you escalate, and then they get the labs locally. You have those labs a day before you see them, and you escalate the dose. The, 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 what we've seen with Ritos, of course, is that, you know, about 20% about of patients actually survive more than a year. Mm. Uh, so we know that those patients actually... Uh, are not necessarily all going to die within six months. So when you look at the equation, you know that there is a significant number of patients who will survive uh, and who will survive, you know, beyond the year. Their quality of life also has not deteriorated with this strategy. The one advantage, I think, with regorafenib, and a little bit of a concern with TES-102, is that with regorafenib, you're not going to see uh, the, the drop in the counts or the febrile neutropenia uh, as we talked, you know, with chemotherapy that puts patients at high risk, perhaps, to get into the hospital or even higher risk uh, for, for a more catastrophic infection. Uh, uh, so, so the other thing that with agorapenib that I, we start thinking more and more about, you know, as this whole discussion around, uh, you know, reintroduction of Folfox or reintroduction of Folfiri uh, or re-challenge, whatever, you know, the flavor du jour is in terms of calling it. Now one really would question whether we should sk skip ahead and just move regorafenib to, to truly to third line uh, in, this, in this instance. And we have you know, data from our Japanese colleagues with the reverse and, and uh, from Concur you know, again in Asia that suggest that less pre-treated patients actually tend to draw even a larger benefit from regorapenib. So this will give docs a chance to, to try that out because I know there has been a hesitancy yeah. among our colleagues to do that. And you, you know you and I like to do that. But I yeah. was just thinking as you were talking about that, that you know the toxicity of Rego, from what I know, can probably look a lot like uh, an early COVID infection with fatigue and, yeah. and the like. So it sort of brings up the issue that we have to be pretty clever if we're treating patients of distinguishing uh, infection, if you will, from side effects of our drugs. So it, it's really, you know, whether that's IO with rashes or Rego with fatigue, fevers, things like that. GI side, you know, there are some GI side of uh, symptoms from the virus as well. So, um, but your dose escalation strategy that almost all of us use now um, does help manage that because you, you, you can kind of see it coming, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it can definitely mitigate for some of that. But you're absolutely right. We live in a world now where every toxicity that we see from our chemotherapy, including, you know, mild fever, rash, diarrhea, nausea, I mean, all these, uh, you know, can raise a red flag uh, and, and can bring more anxiety to the patient and anxiety to uh, the healthcare system as well, you know, as we're learning how to navigate this new world. Uh, so uh, absolutely, I mean, we have to keep our clinical acumen strong, but this is also why it's important to understand uh, the risks, the benefits, the balance of, you know, why we think a patient needs to be treated. You know, one thing we also need to talk about, I think, is, um, you know, for the right patient at this point of time, where uh, we think that no treatment option makes sense, 
the patient at the end of the line, that it may be very important now to have a very straight upfront discussion and make sure that we don't drag them any longer and put them at higher risk and their families at risk as well. Uh, so that also is an added layer that perhaps we need to rethink some of the strategy. You and I, I talked about this Hail Mary effect in the yeah, past. Yeah. Right? I think this may be happening. I mean, our inpatient census right now for our whole division is, is maybe half of what it normally is. And I'm, it's not like cancer took a holiday. So why aren't those people in our clinic and, and always a high percentage of our patients are end of life issues or complications. So I do wonder if there is more of that going on where people basically see the hospital as some place to stay away from at the moment and, and are spending more time. But we, we I want to talk about um, uh, a minor thing and then a bigger thing, and then we'll take questions. And a lot of people talk about skipping doses of treatment, whether it's IO or a cycle of chemo and, the, and the whatnot. But I, I get that on certain situations. But I, as I'm thinking about this, this is really a two to three month plan that we have to make. So one skipped dose probably doesn't make that much impact. You know, go to three weeks, maybe that has an impact over, over a few months. So uh, what's your position on skipping doses and, and as a solution for this or as a, a help for this? You know, my, my view, and it's, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a view of, of how, how to manage skipping doses. So if a patient is starting treatment, I, I don't like to skip doses unless there's a toxicity. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the first month or two is, I believe, this is the, the time to get the best results that will set the tone for the rest of the treatment. Now, if a patient had had two months of chemo and their scan looks great and they're feeling good, et cetera, I have no problem whatsoever skipping a dose here and there or delaying the occasional dose. Uh, you know, I, I don't like the every three weeks regimen, uh, meaning that Folfox or Folfiri or Folfoxiri, just because there is no data that suggests that with the same doses we use that you can stretch the doses significantly beyond. So the occasional dose is okay uh, to push here and there, but uh, generally speaking, I'd like to stick to the plan at least in the first two months of treatment uh, for those patients. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm sort of the same way as um, if it was just a month and we knew it was going to be a month and everything was going to be back to normal, then that's one thing, but yeah. this could drag on. So you don't want to trade off too much there uh, in terms of risk benefit, I think. So use your judgment wisely. And then the last thing I wanted to discuss with you because um, is, is around t surgery timing. As you said, ORs, uh, ventilators, you know, ICUs, post-op recovery, these are all going to be used um, during a surge. We hope not, but may well be used. And um, it certainly adds... Uh, uh, stuff to our system. The breast people are doing lots of neoadjuvant everything right now with hormones as much as they can to try and push surgeries down to the summer. Um, we've got a few circumstances, I think, in our world where we can delay a surgery. I was thinking about, you know, rectal cancer, you know, the watch and wait strategy in, in good responders. I was thinking maybe you could delay that surgery. Um, you know, e there is some evidence of waiting even 12 weeks after you stop your initial neoadjuvant treatment or your neoadjuvant treatment. So um, I think that's a place, whereas the opposite is a patient who doesn't really respond to upfront, you know, still having obstructing symptoms, bleeding, maybe doesn't downstage much. You don't want to sit on that patient because that's a patient that if they lose control over their pelvis, we're in trouble. Um, so you'd probably want to risk the operation uh, in that patient. And then the other one, and I'll get your comment on both of these, is sort of the metastatectomy patient. You know, maybe they were teed up and ready for their liver resection in April. Um, the question is, can we push that to May or June or June or July, really, realistically? Um, and can we bridge that with something? Um, you know, if we keep giving chemo, we might increase liver toxicity, these kinds of things. So rectal cancer, do you agree with my sort of basic strategy and metastatectomy? What's your stance on that? Yeah, so rectal cancer, totally agree. And I think you could even consider for some patients who've had a really good response and, uh, you know, they're, they're anxious about being off treatment. You could just maintain them on capecitabine uh, for a little bit longer. I mean, again, there's no data, and you're right. I mean, 12 weeks is still reasonable, and I'm hoping that sanity will get back to all of us in the next three, uh, 12 weeks. Uh, but but yes, absolutely stretch it. 
and uh, select patients. For patients, and I'll add, before I get to the oligometastatic, uh, it was interesting actually to see some of our colorectal surgeons, you know, now are suggesting that because, because we're cutting down on the, on the number of, of surgeries that for uh, colon cancer patients, so not rectal, colon cancer patients, that they're willing for us to see them first and give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You know, the data that came out that suggests that you, you won't lose benefit and there may be a slight benefit from doing neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy for those colon cancer patients. Yeah. Uh, that perhaps for some of these patients selectively, uh, unless of course they're you know blocked or they're bleeding significantly, you want to take them to surgery. But those that are asymptomatic, just found to have cancer, that they're willing for us to push for chemotherapy first uh, intellect cases. Uh, I, I can't help but resist. There was the Nature Medicine paper where I think there were major responses in MSS neoadjuvant treatment of colon cancer with checkpoint inhibition, but that's not, don't go out and do that. That was in a clinical <laughs> trial, but, but it was really fascinating. So do metastatectomy, and then I thought of one more quick question, and there are a bunch online, so we want to get to those. So oligometastatic disease, uh, again, you know, if surgery is an issue, uh, because again, because of the limitations of the hospitals, etc., you know, additional chemotherapy is problematic for liver mats, right? Because it, you actually end up with a liver that's fatty, that's diseased, and may complicate surgery. For select patients, you know, what we've decided to do is our interventional radiologists are willing to, you know, do a bridge strategy with microwave ablation. Uh, or RFA for certain lesions. And, and then the other, of course, you know, you could still consider those patients for some level of maintenance therapy, yeah. uh, especially those that respond really well. Those that don't respond are not gonna do well anyways. Yeah. Uh, those are the patients you worry anyways about surgical resection and they may not be an issue. Yeah, so we really have to judge. Yeah. I have never, ever been with a group that gave short course radiation for rectal cancer. And for my last, question. I, you know, I start to wonder about they have to clean the room every time between all the patients. You know, it's a difference between 30 treatments and five. Um, maybe this is a window for us to think about that in rectal cancer, particularly if we're giving chemo first. What do you think? We're doing more and more of this. In fact, we have a trial, internal trial that's, uh, that's uh, doing this specifically, but, uh, you know, Washington University uh, published their own data. It looks pretty good. It looks very similar. I mean, very similar to the to the Scandinavian data, uh, you know, doing the five times five seems to 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 do a similar to, to provide a similar benefit with a shortened time. And as you said, this is the time to do it a little bit more than uh, uh, than the five and a half weeks course now. Okay. Next slide, and then Dari, I think you said there's a lot of questions. Tony and I don't. We we, we the NCCN came out over the weekend with a sort of overview document for colon cancer, we published a paper that's sort of like our discussion we just had of scenarios when you would start, when you would stop, um, to sort of, because um, we can't lay everything out by a guideline. You have to use your own judgment and the patient in front of you and make decisions. So we're not gonna spend really insignificant time on, on guidelines, but as you said, Daria, I think there are a bunch of questions, so Tony and I'll shut up and let you ask them. Okay, great. This has been great so far. So yes, I will ask some of the questions that have, have come in and feel free, uh, you know, to jump in and just answer those. So we have a couple of questions on IO. So what about uh, CRC patients that are I on IO therapy? Is there anything uh, known so far that may make them more vulnerable to COVID uh, than patients that are on regular chemo? And do you have any specific considerations regarding treatment with those uh, with IO. So I'll give that a first try and Tony can correct me. So I, I've been following this with our uh, renal melanoma experts to understand what they know because they do it much more than we do. Um, and so far that it's sort of mixed right now. If you needed to, the answer we're getting is that if you needed to start somebody on IO therapy for a major problem, which is why you're starting it, I think you can go ahead and do it. If they're already on it and um, they're doing okay, then it might be one of those windows where you skip a treatment, take a month or so off, particularly if you've been on it for many months or a year or more. So um, there's conflicting data. Um, not There's not much data. It's all theoretical, really, about risk and, and benefit of, of uh, having a viral infection at the same time as IO. So 
again, it's the, the what trumps the decision, sorry about that word, um, is whether um, you think clinically it is the right thing to do, it's important for that patient versus you're less sure how much it's going to help and then I would hold off. Tony, what's your thought? No, I, you know, I'm, I, I will agree with this. I, I'd say that, you know, it's, again, we, we, we have to dwell back into the experience with influenza and other viruses. And again, this is a, this is a little different. Uh, but yet, you know, uh, we know that our patients are at higher risk with the flu and others. Hepatitis, right? We give IO and hepatitis. Yeah, absolutely. So there hasn't been a real uh, evidence in the past that suggests that those patients are at higher risk. Now, here's, here's, I say that, but here's one one no, no, note of caution. Uh, we do know that uh, there is the rare pulmonary toxicity, and 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 we again we don't know if those patients uh, who get some pulmonary toxicity end up with COVID uh, and exhibit some of the SARS symptoms. Uh, whether those patients actually, and you would expect because of the duality of the insult, uh, that those patients may do actually worse. Uh, but that's a rare. Uh, a rare manifestation or toxicity of, of IO. Uh, so overall, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, for the right patient uh, to give them uh, uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab or whatever. Uh, this is actually a point probably of caution though. Those are the patients, this, these are the times actually where I would really consider holding off a CTLA-4 in addition to the PD-1 inhibitor. Yeah, that's right. There is more toxicity, and the toxicity can be quite tough and lead patients to hospital, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. And they've never been compared head to head, meaning a CTLA4 plus PD1 may not be any better than a PD1. Other than historically, we may have hints here and there. They've never been compared, and most patients don't need both. And so I encourage at this point of time most folks to consider just the one, so either pembrolizumab or nivolumab, and, I, and keep the same cautions. For those patients that you would for patients who are on chemotherapy, and that's about it. And I would say if you did use a doublet, to make sure you're using that lower dose version, which yeah. seems to be better. Yeah. How about another one? We got time for a couple okay. more. So again, you, got, you both spoke a lot about you know adjusting surgeries and treatments. Um, so many elective procedures are currently being postponed, including screening for colonoscopies. Uh, once these procedures resume, there's a potential that there will be an influx of new cancer diagnosis. So how should oncologists be prepared for this? And should these patients be treated more aggressively since they may have a likely longer time to develop metastases? Yeah, I think most people, as soon as they're released, are not going to go get their colonoscopy. <laughs> that will not be their first thing on their, their list. They'll go to Costco first and then, you know, but, um, you know, we, all of this is true, right? One of the reasons why telehealth has become so important to us, uh, particularly as a division chief, is like, okay, we can't just put all of these off to, to, to June or July, because first the new fellows will be there then, but secondly, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we just won't be able to handle the capacity. So uh, we want to keep as much going as we can uh, through all of this. Screening procedures, you know, for folks who are listening in who are just routine screens, um, they've already waited a year, I promise you, because, uh, you know, they've been putting it off. So get it when you can. We'll, we'll catch up. Um, there, there probably will be a little uh, wave uh, of new diagnoses, um, just as there is after any major holiday, right? You get a new wave in January because people put off their testing in December. Um, so we're kind of used to those waves. Um, it, a little bit depends on, you know, how long this goes on. Um, so we're just going to have to be ready for when they come. Yeah, what, one, uh, one aspect of uh, screening, I think, that perhaps now would make even more sense is the utilization of tests like Cologuard uh, that certainly, you know, would, would help with, with the backlog around colonoscopies. Uh, although, you know, there are some limitations to the test, but overall it has a high sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, maybe its specificity is not as powerful as its sensitivity, but in this case, you really care about the sensitivity more than the specificity. And it is clearly something you're encouraged to do at home. Yes. 
<laughs> so it's like a home activity. You can't do any more social dis distancing than that, right? <laughs> Your own poop on a, in a, in a, in a tube. <laughs> All right, maybe time for one more, then we gotta let people go. Great, yes. Yeah. So this is kind of, and we can kind of make it a little bit more broad, but with the recent approval of Braftovi and Cetuximab for patients with a V600 E mutation that typically have such a poor prognosis, would the current climate around COVID-19 delay you from initiating a brand new therapy? So I think we can kind of generalize and say, would this, you know, climate delay you from starting a new therapy, any new therapy? Tony, you start with that one. I'd say this group of patients does incredibly bad that we do not want to miss on the opportunity, understanding that this doublet not only just prolongs survival significantly may change the biology of the disease, but it also improves the quality of life of the patients. So again, I go back to the palliative effect, not just the life prolonging effect, but the palliative effect. And this is a group of patients that cannot wait three to four weeks. They go downhill very quickly. This is one that I would consider in the semi-urgent semi to urgent category. I mean, so I couldn't agree more. If you got something like this and, and uh, on a result back, for example, you got your genetic test back, patient with metastatic disease, this would be a regimen you could change to, quite honestly, um, you know, in a patient that's on IV chemotherapy. So, um, you know, it's, that's one that would be high on my list for, for value over risk. Uh, value of the therapy would justify going ahead and initiating that, that treatment, in my opinion. Okay, great. Um, I did have one more thing, uh, Dr. Marshall. Um, the paper that you mentioned, where is that going to be available? So it was published in, it's in press officially as of today, uh, or actually yesterday, um, in the journal Colorectal Cancer. Um, and they have, uh, we, we literally wrote it over the weekend, and they, because of its topic, they did a high, quick turnaround. And we did post it online, and, um, and so we'll get the link before the actual PDF is produced, which may take another day or two. So... Uh, they're, they're very, the journal and the publishers were very generous about um, taking an op-ed section, basically, um, and letting us uh, put out some recommendations or some uh, broad, you know, uh, rules of the game uh, to follow. So uh, I'm sure you and we will uh, send that out, that okay. link. Great. Great. Um, so that appears to be our time for tonight. Uh, I want to give you both a huge thank you for joining us um, out of your busy practices to sit down and convey these pivotal discussion topics with our audience. Uh, thank you to our listeners, and I truly hope you were able to gain valuable insight into how the clinical practice is changing during this pandemic. Um, you will be able to listen back and watch again shortly following this webinar. Continue to OncLive.com. And sign up for our e newsletters or follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to get updates when we will be broadcasting more of these webinars. You promised us a section on Netflix, right? I mean, we got a whole channel now, don't we? That's right. Yep. And it's going to be featuring both of you. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes our webcast. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.